visitors with us. I appreciate you being here. My guess is, if you're like me, you're appreciating the sunshine that we're having today and the little bit of a, a warmer weather as winter is trying to cling on to, but, but it's a little bit warmer for us today. This morning, we're going to be thinking about marriage and adultery. It's not a pleasant topic to discuss, but I, I wanted to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 19 today and answer the question, how does adultery hurt marriage? And just as you think about that question, how would you answer it? And certainly we can think about things like divorce, but beyond that, how would you answer the question? How does, how does adultery hurt marriage? I think it's interesting that even as society somewhat moves in more and more of a godless direction, and yet people still, um, some, some in the world still hold to the biblical notion of marriage. And even people who are, you know, atheists will get married. And I just think it's, it's interesting that, that some still hold to the biblical notion, and the Bible talks about it in Hebrews, when it says that marriage is honorable among all, that you have that idea that some still hold that marriage is honorable, but I would suggest that number seems to be less and less all the time. And that any more, um, it's interesting to look at statistics sometimes, not all the times, but to look at statistics that the number of divorces in some places actually decreasing. And some will, will say, oh, that's such a wonderful thing that divorces are going down. But the reason that divorces are going down is because people are not getting married at all. And so it's not necessarily um, a good thing that any more moving in together and just cohabiting and living together, it really does not have any social stigma attached to it anymore. Just, just think about those of you who are, who are older. Think back to the 1950s and, and think about the social stigma that was attached to living together outside of marriage. If a couple before, if maybe they never planned to get married, if they decided to just move in together in the 1950s, what would society think? Right? There, there was, even back then, there was somewhat of a social stigma attached to it. That social stigma does not exist anymore. That now society fully accepts the idea of people living together and, and never getting married at all. And even among those who are married, adultery is common. Home wrecking is common. And any more even, you'll, you'll hear things spoken about that even 20 years ago, you would never have thought that people would go down the road of open marriages. You all familiar with that phrase, open marriages? Sometimes you'll hear it um, amongst the, the Hollywood stars and starlets and what it is, is it is an attempt to legitimize adultery, where you have husbands and wives saying it's okay if their spouses sleep with other people, and they are okay with that. It's, it is an attempt to legitimize something that is wrong, namely adultery. In thinking about adultery, I think it's, it's interesting to look in Scripture. And for example, the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians, when it speaks about the fruit of the Spirit, the very first fruit of the Spirit is love. You want to guess what the first work of the flesh is? You would think it would be hatred, wouldn't you? But it's not hatred, it's adultery. That's the first work of the flesh. And I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's anything, I don't know what to read into that. That the first fruit of the Spirit is love, but the first, and hatred is one of the works of the flesh but it's not listed as the first one. The first one is adultery, and I just think that that's, that's interesting. Um, I would like to look in Matthew 19, and we'll, we'll, as we get into the sermon itself, let's just read the first 10 verses of Matthew 19. It says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, 
and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is, be it is better not to marry. But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. So back to our question. How does adultery hurt marriage? Just really from this passage. I would suggest one way that it hurts marriage is that adultery removes God and godliness from the relationship. That that's, that's what it does. When he's, when he's talking to them and he says, have you not read how he made them in the beginning? People in the world have this strange idea that marriage is a man-made thing. Marriage is not a man-made thing. It's, it's an even stranger thing, but most don't realize it, that the, the person who said, and so man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, the man who said that was not a man at all. It was God. It was God speaking to Adam. Adam, the man who frankly did not have a mother. But, God, but it's God who joined them together. It's a God-made thing. That is what marriage is, and that's what Jesus references. Have you not read, he who made them at the beginning, therefore what God has joined together? Let not man separate. As we think about it, and we just think about what adultery does is it removes God and godliness from the equation. It removes God and godliness from the relationship. Was David thinking about God? when he's up on the roof of the king's palace and he looks down and he sees her bathing and he lusts after her and he calls for her to come to his quarters. Do you think David was thinking about God when he did that? I, I'm not a betting man, but I'd bet on that. You think David was thinking about God? No. David was in no way thinking about God. He was in no way thinking about godliness. That's not what he was doing. Husbands and wives are called to be heirs together of the grace of life, according to 1 Peter 3 at verse 7. What adultery tries to do, adultery tries to destroy that relationship. Husbands and wives are called to be heirs together. That's one reason that when young people who have not, who have not married yet, and as they are thinking about such things, they need to think very seriously about who they are going to marry. Because husbands and wives are called to be. And we're going to read a verse in, in Malachi. And actually, we're going to read it, might read it tonight. But it talks about how God wants godly offspring. And as we think about that, and, and we think about how adultery hurts marriage, or pardon me, how it, how, yeah, how it hurts marriage, how it removes God and godliness. Adultery tries to destroy the relationship of heirs together of the grace of life. Without God and godliness, and I want you to think about this one, without God and godliness, where do spouses learn about love, respect, commitment, honor, authority, and even obedience? If you pull God and godliness out of the equation, all right, and we think about how husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church, but if you pull Jesus out of that equation, if you pull God out of that equation, do you really think spouses are going to love each other the way that God wants them to? If you, pull, if you pull God out of the equation, why would you? If you don't have the example, if you don't have the example of Jesus and his church, if you don't have the example of deity loving and teaching us what love looks like, if you pull God out, what are you left with? Right? And you just, you don't learn about love outside of God. What about respect? 
Wives, see that you respect your husbands. But if you pull God out of the equation, if you pull Jesus out of the equation, right, as you think about submission and you think about, again, Jesus loving the church, and as you think about the church being the bride of Christ, and you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that talks about the headship and the head of Christ being God, the head of man being Christ, the head of woman being man. But if you pull God and Jesus out of all that equation, then what happens? Everything falls apart. Right? All the relationships fall apart, and all of a sudden it's everybody does whatever they want to do. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. What about commitment? Right? Without God and godliness, if you pull, if you pull them out of the equation, you think there's any commitment there? And you just go right down the list. Honor, we've spoken about it recently in the adult class that Brace is leading us in. Value. Value. If you pull God and godliness out, you really think spouses value each other like they should? It doesn't happen. Authority. You might consider that. And then there's passages that speak about obedience as well. All those words, all those traits are godly. And what adultery does is it tries to remove them from the equation. That's, how, that's one way that it hurts marriage that it removes love and respect and commitment and honor and authority and obedience. It removes God and godliness. This is how adultery really hurts marriage, one way. Another way, though, that it, that it has a negative effect, adultery affects others involved. We might think about it wounds and it leaves scars on the innocent party. I want you to come back to Malachi, and we are going to read the passage. Come back to Malachi chapter 2. This evening we're going to be thinking about raising children, and I didn't really necessarily plan to do a, a Sunday on the family. It's just turning out that way. But in, Mal in Malachi 2, I thought we were going to read the passage tonight, but here it is in Malachi 2 at verse 13. It says, And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Understand what he's saying? Their worship was being rejected. And the reason their worship was being rejected, verse 14, yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between, between you and the wife, of your, your, pardon me, the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant, but, he did, not, but did he not make them one? having a remnant of the Spirit, and why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you do not deal treacherously. How does adultery hurt marriage? It wounds and it leaves scars on the innocent the party that is doing what's right, the party that has been violated, frankly, they are, they are wounded and they are scarred. And those scars will likely stay with them through their whole lives. It also, and we'll, we'll come back to it, the adulterer, if they are put away, and I'm not saying they have to be put away. But if they are put away, they have now removed themselves. And we'll come back to this point. The adulterer, if they are put away, they have now removed themselves from all the blessings that are found within the proverb that says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. If they have removed themselves from those blessings, if they are put away. We'll come back to that, though. We might also think about the guilty party's partner. And I don't think it's wrong to call them a, a partner, even a partner in sin. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Holy Spirit uses marriage language in describing this sinful relationship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 at verse 13, it says, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. We'll pause right there, because I want you to think about an argument that people make. And the argument goes something like this. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares what I do with my body? 
right? That's that's basically the argument. And I and, and pardon me, but it's as we are talking about these matters, they just see it as it, it's an outward act of the flesh. And, and just because I know there are kids in the audience, I don't want to use the word, but you know what word I would use. And people say, well, that's just all it is. It's just that. And they don't realize that there are deeper things going on here. But the, the argument, who cares? Well, verse 14, as it speaks about um, the Lord is for the body. Verse 14, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us, raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. That's, that is marriage language. That's where it's quoting from. And I'm not saying that they're married but they have joined themselves together, right? That relationship. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Talking about marriage, faithful in marriage. Malachi, when Malachi spoke about it, it talked about because of the remnant of the Holy Spirit, right? Talks about all those things. But as we think about the guilty party's partner in this sin, and we simply ask the question, will this new relationship, do you think this new relationship will be suddenly filled with godliness and faithfulness and love? No, no. <laughs> That's not what this relationship is based on. It's not based on God and godliness. Right? Do you think this new relationship where you have faithlessness and godlessness and a lack of commitment that all of a sudden the guilty party's partner, do you think they're hoping for faithfulness and godliness? That's no. No. As we, we think about it, it's bad for them too. It's bad for, it is bad for the guilty persons, the guilty party's partner. It's bad for them. That's what the passage in Matthew spoke about when it spoke about if someone marries them, then they commit adultery. Right? That's, that's what it said back there in Matthew 19. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So it's bad for them. It's bad for them too. Now, what about the family? What about the rest of the family? And I, I hope you're in Matthew 19. If you're not in Matthew 19, you might turn over there. But over there in Matthew 19. I don't know if it's a coincidence. <laughs> I don't know if it's a coincidence. I'm not a big believer in coincidences. But right after the Lord speaks about these issues involving marriage, right after he speaks about these issues, do you notice what the very next passage is? The very next passage. Then little children were brought to him in verse 13 that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. I just think it's interesting as he speaks about marriage and these issues involving marriage and the family. In the very next passage, he's blessing the children. What about the family? How will this affect, how will adultery affect the goal of raising godly offspring? Because that's what God is looking for. Believe it or not, God is not just looking for people. You know, even in the Old Testament, even as he says, be fruitful and multiply, he wasn't just looking for people. He wasn't just looking for humans. You know, you have that contrast with the sons of God and the sons of men. God forever has been, not just been looking for people, he's been looking for godly people. <laughs> he wants godly offspring. Not just offspring, but godly offspring. Not just kids, but godly kids. That's what he's looking for. So 
Adultery, how it affects others involved. How will adultery affect the goal of raising godly children? What about the family? What about the family? I would suggest adultery has a negative effect on all parties involved. Every single party. At the, at the absolute most, what adultery is, is a passing pleasure of sin. And that passing pleasure, frankly, quickly passes. And even that passing pleasure of sin is still sin. It's still sinful. I don't, it, it does not matter, seeing how God instituted these things. It does not matter if society accepts it. It does not matter if the Supreme Court accepts it. It does, it does not matter. What God has done, God has done. And it's not just a New Testament concept. It's not even just a Law of Moses concept. Jesus takes it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All the way back. Even before sin ever entered the picture. He takes it all the way back. Adultery has a negative effect on all parties involved. And then, of course, we have adultery affects... And that should be an A. I won't tell you why. That should be an F, affect, A, F, F. You want a, you want a five-second grammar lesson? A, F, F, E, C, T is a verb. E, F, F, E, C, T is a noun. Don't ask me why. No, ask Becky. Anyway, <laughs> she saw my title Sunday and was helping me out. Sometimes I need, a lot of times I need help with grammar. Adultery affects the guilty party. The glue of Matthew 19 at verse 5. And it is a glue. That word there, what God has joined together, that is the word for glue. They are stuck together. That verse, like I said, it's a quotation from Genesis as God made Eve. And we know what God said that led to him creating Eve. There in Genesis, when the Lord says, it is not good for man to be alone, I will make him a helper comparable. Before the devil even tempted Eve. I'm not going to say there was a problem because it wasn't a problem. Sin had not entered the picture yet. But the very fact that man, before sin ever entered the picture, apparently needed help. You ever thought about that? <laughs> before sin, was it wrong for Adam to need help in the garden? Apparently not. <laughs> Before sin ever entered the picture, God says, it is not good. Wait a minute, I thought you created everything, and what, what, did, what did God say? He created everything, and it was all good. It was all good. And he creates Adam, and he puts him in the garden to tend and to keep it. But then as he's watching Adam tend and keep the garden, he says, you know what? It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable. And even that was, was good. Adam needed help. Even for selfish reasons. Even for selfish reasons. Adultery should be avoided. Adam needed Eve. Right? How does adultery hurt marriage? It's because it attempts, it attempts to to rip apart marriage. It attempts to rip apart what God has joined together. And here is the Lord, here is the Lord speaks about it in Matthew 19. He says, and he gives, he gives the exception, except for sexual immorality and marries another. What adultery tries to do is it tries to dissolve that glue as the Lord has joined them together. Those who would violate God's pattern on marriage, they find themselves quickly in the realm of verses 11 and 12 where he speaks about the eunuchs. And he uses that figure. But those who want to do the right thing, and, and as we think about it, and, and let's, let's make this point, if you think adultery is not a problem for everybody, and I'm not saying everyone has committed adultery. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if David could be caught up in it, then anybody can be caught up in it. That's what I'm saying. Do you really think that you're more faithful than the man after God's own heart? Do you think your faith is stronger than David's? 
You know, this is the guy who killed Goliath. You think your faith is stronger than David's? All I'm saying is, if David could get caught up in it, then anybody could be caught up in it. Every one of us could be caught up in it. And if we are caught up in it, and if we are put away, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that the adulterer has to be put away, but if they are put away, if they are divorced, because they are guilty, they are guilty, they quickly find themselves in the realm of verse 12. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. It is a great sadness because those who are guilty of adultery and put away, they must become eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. Ultimately, they have hurt themselves. That's what they have done. They have, by committing adultery, and as they are put away, they have found themselves removed again from that proverb, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And it's a, it's a sad thing because they've hurt a lot of people, but ultimately, who have they hurt? They've hurt themselves. They've hurt themselves temporarily and perhaps eternally. And we... We say perhaps because what David had to do, and and I understand it's the Old Testament. We we'll, we don't have time to go down to the down the rabbit hole, frankly, of what the Lord speaks about here. There in verse eight, when He says Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted it to be. There were things that were permitted in the Old Testament. David, and let's just ask this question very simply: What were you supposed to do with adulterers in the Old Testament? Stone them. Why didn't they stone David? Is that what he deserved? Yes. That's why it's called grace. Now David, in partaking of God's grace, and he knew full well what he was deserving of, but his sin was forgiven. Nathan the prophet speaks about that. But then in Psalm, when David writes about it, and he says, I will teach transgressors your ways. And he had to recommit himself to God and godliness. I in no way think when he saw Bathsheba and when he committed that act, and when he called for Uriah, when he did all those things, he was not thinking about God and godliness. He was thinking about himself like we all think about ourselves from time to time. But as he was confronted with his sin and as he turned from his sin after fasting and praying for his child and his child dies and he rises up and he says, he cannot, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. And he had to commit and recommit to God. That's what he had to do. I will teach transgressors your ways. As we think about David's adultery, who did David hurt with that? Did he hurt Bathsheba? Her husband died. Her child died. So we don't even have to ask the question, did he hurt his family? Did he hurt Israel? He brought shame on the whole congregation. Did he hurt himself? Just as we think about it, this is, this is what happens. It's, it is a great sadness. Now, what is the answer? The answer is love. The answer is love. The answer is marriage. The answer, in God's definition of marriage, the answer is faithfulness. The answer is commitment. The answer is contentment. The answer is tenderheartedness. Those are the answers. And if, if marriages do break, and sometimes marriages do break, then the answer is rededication. Rededication. To the Lord, that is what is called for as we look past the temporary and we look towards eternity. Here in Matthew, come over to chapter 22 as we begin to wrap things up. Come over to chapter 22. In chapter 19, it was the Pharisees wanting to test him. In chapter 22, it's the Sadducees. Chapter 22, verse 23, The same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife 
and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the women died also. The woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, and we'll just pause right there. They didn't care about, the re they didn't believe in the resurrection. <laughs> they didn't believe in it. And I think ultimately, as you think about it, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the, when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The Sadducees just wanted to play with Scripture. You know what? They just wanted to play with marriage too. That's what they were doing. That's what was happening in Judaism at that time. They were just playing with marriage. Here, the Sadducees, they're just playing with Scriptures as well. And it was a mistake. It was a mistake. And as we think about marriage, and we think about heirs together of the grace of life, and we think about helpers helping one another, and as we are helping one another and heirs of the grace of life, we are looking toward heaven. We are looking towards a time when we are actually not married to our spouses anymore. And so those who find themselves in the eunuch passage of Matthew 19, what they have to do is they have to rededicate themselves and remember that this world is not our home. This world is not our home with its houses and its cars and its jobs and its businesses and even our marriages. The marriages that we have, there's a reason. <laughs> there is a reason that the preacher, whoever the preacher, or whoever it is, when people get married, what do they say? Till death do us part. It's because it's a scriptural concept. It's a biblical concept. It's a godly concept. Because in the resurrection of the dead, we are no longer married. We want to be in heaven with our spouses, but they are not going to be our spouses anymore. We want to be in heaven with our children. But you know what? In a sense, they are not our children anymore. We want to be in heaven. I want to be in heaven with my parents. They're not my parents anymore. I want to be in heaven with my grandparents. They're not my grandparents anymore. I want to be in heaven with Jesus because ultimately in heaven, what are we all? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about what that family tree looks like. Think about your family tree. I'm not, a, I'm not a family tree guy, but you know, when the family tree comes down, what's the family tree going to look like in heaven? You know what it's going to look like? It's going to have one trunk, God. It's going to come down, and then what is it going to look like? Everybody else. That's what it's going to look like. And those who are caught up in marriages that break apart. They have to rededicate themselves to that. Eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And those who are married, we need to rededicate ourselves to the time when we will not be married anymore, not to our spouses. And of course, as we think about the invitation, we know what we're preparing for. We know what the church is. It is the bride of Christ. There is marriage in heaven. It's just not between John and Jen anymore, or Brace and Ashley, <laughs> or Eric and Faith. The marriage is between us and Jesus. Come and I will show you the Lamb's wife, the bride of Christ. Jesus loves the church and gave himself for her. And that is the invitation. If you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, the invitation is to become a part of the bride of Christ. Now, what does it mean to be a part of the bride of Christ? It is about love. It is about faithfulness. It is about commitment. It is about sacrifice. It is about submission. It is about all of those things that we've spoken about as the Lord. Remember what John the Baptist said, right? As he talks about the friend of the bridegroom, talking about the friend of Jesus. He must increase and I must decrease. 
and he rejoiced. He rejoiced at the Lord's at the Lord's voice. So the invitation for you, if you're not a Christian, the invitation is to turn from your sins, to turn from your sins, to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, to be baptized for the remission of sins, and to rise and to walk, to rise and walk in newness of life. And it is an amazing thing that the Lord is so forgiving. That is an amazing thing. The Lord's capacity for forgiveness. That he can forgive those who are the very reason for his son's death. That he can forgive us. But that is what the groom does for his bride. In Ephesians, when it speaks about it, and it speaks about the washing of water. In Ephesians and Hebrews, I believe. But as we think about it, he wants to present his bride, actually is the Ephesians passage, without spot or blemish or any other such thing, is how Ephesians goes, that he might present her to himself. That's what we look forward to. That's what we look forward to. The invitation is yours. If you're here this morning and need to respond, please come. While we